Hello, my name is AJ Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida, and I want to bring you today a video on one of the most famous chess games ever played. This is the chess game uh, Bobby Fischer uh, versus Boris Spassky. This is from their famous 1972 World Championship match in Reykjavik, Iceland. And first of all, I wanted to say something, just briefly comment about that match. Uh, that match changed chess, I, I think, like very few other matches in the history of chess. Um, the very one of the very first matches between McDonald and Labordinet, that caught the worldwide attention in a way not seen before also. I mean, it gripped the world. They wrote newspaper articles about it, and it was the focus of world attention. And um, I don't know if any other chess matches other than the series between Labordinet and the one between uh, Fisher and Spassky ever got the attention of uh, Bobby, you know, of the whole world stage when Bobby Fischer won the world championship in 1972. You know, also too, you have to remember the time, and at that time, the backdrop of the game was very important. Uh, it was at the height of the Cold War, and basically, in 1972, the Russians were considered the enemy, and quote unquote. And you know, it, it was basically us against them. You know, and it was one man, one rogue. rogue chess player Bobby Fischer versus a team player, you know, uh, Boris Spassky, he came there with all of his seconds and everything, and supposedly he had an army of analysts feeding him ideas. So it was really a lot of contrast there. And so that, that match, in my opinion, changed chess like few other matches in the history of chess. And of course, I was alive at that time. I was in about ninth grade of high school, so I remember that match very clearly. Um, for the first time ever that I had ever seen a chess match was, you know, it was front page news on the newspapers uh, back when newspapers were really a big deal before the internet. It was also the, there were only three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and it was a leading story every night on the, uh, the news stories. So that was a really big deal back in those days. But anyway, so we have this, this is game number six. Of course, this is a very famous game. It's one of the greatest games, uh, all-time games from World Championship play. And if you go to my website, www.ajchess.com forward slash life master aj uh, and then go to index.html and then go to my best game page uh, best games page I have a very long write up there and, I'll, and you can read what I've written there about that game I'm not going to repeat that here uh, my annotations here on this particular version of the chess game are based primarily on Yasser Sarawan's excellent book Winning Chess Brilliancies I, I love that book that's a book I've um, uh, I, I've this game's been annotated. Of course, this game has been annotated in literally dozens of different books. Um, you know, Gligoric did a, a book on this match. Um, Evans did a book on this match. I mean, many people did a book on this match. Probably too many to name. And also, too, this book, this game is in one of my favorite books, the Mammoth Book of the World's Greatest Chess Games, by John M's, John Nunn, and Graham Burgess. Of course, that, this game is also in that book, and many other books beside. And I have a biography on my webpage. Also, I have a webpage on that on this game, and I have updated it just for this game, uh, for this video. Uh, it was updated last year, but I'm updating it again, adding some extra links and some extra information. And uh, that, when I'm done with the video, I will post that and the link to that video in the section that says show more. Also, too, now there is a, a free download. If you have any of the Chessbase software, Chessbase 10, Chessbase 11, um, any of the engines, Fritz, Shredder, or any of the other engines that have the Chessbase logo on it, there's a free download there, and you can open it down. You have to unzip it, but you, it's a compressed file, an archive file, but it's a Chessbase file, and you can open that and download it with any Chessbase software. Uh, this is a really g uh, great game. Um, it, I, I think it was a, a surprise to the Russians. Uh, I mean, they knew Bobby Fischer was a great player, but... He played in a manner in the sixth game that I don't think he'd ever played before. Um, and, you know, he did a lot of just different things in this match. And also, too, he changed his play a little bit. Uh, just briefly to give you a, a backdrop of this, this was game six, of course. In the first game, Fisher played an Imzo Indian. I think he was a bit nervous. He grabbed a, a rook pawn in the corner on H2 that could have gotten him in trouble and uh, wound up losing that game. In the second game, he didn't even bother to show up. At this point, people are talking about that the match was over and that you know things were pretty much a done deal that Spassky was going to win. Game three was played in a closed ping pong room, a little bitty closed room, and Spassky might have actually made a mistake in not in agreeing to play in that room. If I think if he'd stood his ground and, and not agreed to play in that room, the match might have been terminated right then, 
and uh, he would have remained world champion, and Fisher might have disappeared into obscurity. Who knows? But uh, anyway, game three was a uh, Bononi, and uh, Fisher played that very well um, and won a one-sided game. In game four, Fisher played one of his all-time favorite variations. He played the Sozin Sicilian against uh, F um, Spassky's 1E4, and the Russians hit him with a huge theoretical novelty. In fact, a whole series of ideas that they had prepared, and it was only Fisher's genius that allowed him to draw that game. Game five was a Nimzo Indian, and Fisher was black, and again, he won a rather one-sided contest. Uh, he played a Hubner variation. So this was game six, and now all of a sudden after, you know, of course, Spassky started off with a two-game lead, but suddenly after only five games, now the game is, uh, the, the match is tied. So this is a very crucial, critical game. And it's also crucial in a lot of other reasons, and I'll touch on that as, the, as, as we go into the game. But let's, let's go ahead and go into the game here. And the ratings here that I give, uh, 2880 for Fisher and 2743, those are not the official FIDE ratings. Uh, those are the, the uh, chess metrics waiting ratings, www.chessmetrics.com, the very famous website of Jeff Sonis. He's a famous mathematician and, and statistician, and he's done a lot of research on chess. Uh, at that time, uh, Fisher's uh, rating was roughly, his actual FIDE rating was roughly 2785, and I believe Spassky was around 2660. Those were the actual published ratings at the time that this game was played, the actual FIDE or FIDE ratings. But going into the game, anyway, Fisher starts, starts off 1c4. Now, that in itself was a shock. Fisher had not only played a handful of Englishes his an entire career. I think, in fact, one time in her, in her zonal, he played c4 against Pano, and, and Pano resigned. But that was probably because he was objecting to having had to play on an off day when he should have had a rest day. But um, uh, ignoring all that, um, this is an English, and Fisher decides not to play the uh, Sicilian uh, and, or his normal king pawn. And uh, because of, of uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, um, uh, Fisher played his favorite Sozin game four, and the, the Russians hit him with a, a real important idea, which he may not have figured out how to counter it yet. So anyway, Fisher did come prepared to this match with a whole bunch of new ideas, and that was uh, fairly obvious. But having been burned in game four, Fisher is not anxious to see any new TNs in his normal king pawn lines. So he's obviously changing up. And he's also got a few new ideas for uh, Spassky himself. And also, too, there was actually a cover of Chess Life, which actually turned out to be very prophetic. And in that Chess Life, there was a cartoon, and they were going over, there was books and magazines laying on the table, and then one of his seconds were asking him, but Boris, what if he doesn't play one pawn to king four? So uh, in a way, that 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 was a, just a cartoon on the cover of Chess Life, Chess Life in Review, actually, but it turned out to be very prophetic and, and very telling because, actually, I don't think Spassky was well enough prepared in case Fisher did change up in his openings. So anyway, Fisher plays C4, and I think he did this with a reason. He's trying to avoid certain variations that Spassky's very strong in, Nimzo Indians and other things, and I think here that you know he played this with a reason. In other words, he knew what he was going to transpose into, but he played this to avoid possibly some of Spassky's other defenses. And he, and Fisher himself likes a Grunfeld, so I don't think he wanted to play one pawn queen four and may necessarily play the Grunfeld or maybe even show his hand, show his cards, and show what he believed to be the best line against the Grunfeld. So if he had played a straight up 1d4, then it's possible Spassky in a piece of psychological preparation could have prepared the Grunfeld, him and his seconds could have prepared the Grunfeld and played Bobby's own weapon against him. So that's one of the reasons I think that Fisher did not do that. But anyway, here he plays c4, and Spassky responds e6. And um, I think this is actually a weakness uh, of Spassky's. Uh, when anyone ever played the English against Spassky, as far as I know, especially in his adult career, he almost always would try to transpose to a Queen's Gambit decline. And I think this was a monumental weakness of Spassky that he didn't have a more varied approach to the openings. And, um, you know, he was really dependent on one line, one specific line. But um, I think that this in itself shows a, a, a small gap in Spassky's preparation or in his repertoire. And Fisher apparently is going to be able to exploit this. 
moving on with the game, you know, White's next move, of course, you know, it's, it's, there's four basic, uh, just really quickly, there's four basic principles to the opening. It's control the center, develop your pieces quickly and rapidly toward the center, uh, protect the king and castle early, that's a two-part equation, and maintain the material balance with an emphasis on square control. And those are the only four principles. I mean, those are the principles that are at play all the time in every single opening. And anyone else tells you anything else is a principle, they're simply wrong because for something to be a principle, it has to be a recurrent theme in every single opening. And those four themes, uh, uh, are, are those four principles are thematic in every single opening played. It doesn't matter what opening you pick. So those are your four basic principles to, to the opening phase of chess. And, and of course the players are good enough to, you know, they're playing at the world championship level. They know all that. So Spassky plays d5. As I said earlier, every time facing the English, he almost always would play, um, you know, angling for a, uh, you know, a queen's gambit to kind. Backing up just a second, too, when Fisher played two and knight f3, he could have played two knight c3 here, put the knight on, white knight on c3, but then there was a possible, you know, possibility that Spassky could play knight f6 and f d4, bishop b4, and Fisher would be forced to play the Nimzo Indian. Fisher himself played the Nimzo Indian. It was one of his favorite weapons. I don't think he really wanted to face a Nimzo Indian himself, at least his move order. I don't think he ever allowed that in the match, so I think uh, by his move order, he's showing that he himself does not want to face an Emzo Indian. So anyway, knight f3, d5, and Fisher plays d4. Now now White has transposed to the queen's gambit decline, the QGD, the queen QGD. This is in itself a tremendous surprise. Fisher in his entire life, as far as I know, had never once played the white side of this uh, opening in his whole career. He'd always said queen gambit was boring in a draw. However, here in the, in the World Championship match, he obviously has a lot of surprises prepared. Uh, the whole the course of the match showed that Fisher had prepared a great many surprises in many different openings. He played the uh, Alekhine's defense and was probably solely responsible for uh, the resuscitation of the Alekhine's defense after that opening had been virtually dormant for, for many, many years. No one had played it, no grandmaster had taken it seriously for a long time, but after Fisher adopted it in this match, it saw a huge revival. And that's true just about of all of Fisher's openings. Fisher would use something, and, and of course, it would become tremendously popular. Uh, and the only question is, why didn't Fisher play 1d4? And I think probably, as I explained earlier, there were many different ways that Spassky could have uh, responded to 1d4. So Fisher's move order in itself is, shows a very good knowledge of, uh, of Spassky and his opening repertoire. In other words, he's basically you know, steering Spassky into what he, he is prepared while staying away possibly from some of Spassky's preparations. Also, too, I don't think uh, Fisher played the, the, white, the uh, black side of the King's Indian, and I don't think he wanted to face a King's Indian himself. And his move order also shows that. I don't think he ever allowed uh, Spassky to ever play a King's Indian, and certainly not an Imzo Indian. So continuing on with the game, knight f6, knight c3, bishop e7, bishop g5, black castles, e3. And now we have a very normal position out of the queen's gambit decline. Now one of the main lines here, I'm just going to run through this quickly, is probably the main main line in the uh, queen's gambit decline would be c6. Let's just do this quickly. White plays rook c1, knight bd7, and now bishop d3. That would be the main main line of the uh, Queen's game of decline or the classical line. And then now um, black could play pawn takes pawn on c4, bishop takes c4, knight d5, and that's the Capablanca defense, which the Capablanca system, which is very well known. And also, you know, you have other lines here too that, you know, you could transpose into. This is also a transposition to the same line, different move order. But um, anyway, uh, um, you know, there, there were many different ways that Spassky could have gone from this position, but, uh, and move orders are almost infinite, you know, in the number of transpositions. But here, um, Spassky plays what he normally plays here, which is h6. And this is a, I give this move an exclam here because if Spassky's sticking true to his guns, which he should, until something's blown out of the water or something gets messed up, then then you should stick to your main weapons, especially in, a, in something as, in, as important as a world's championship match. And h6 is a common in two main lines, the Lasker's defense and something called the TMB, the tartikor makaganov bondarevsky system. Many of the books simply refer to it nowadays as just the TMB system. 
And uh, th this, the common idea is obviously to kick the bishop and ask the white bishop to make a decision. And usually the bishop retreats now to bishop h4. Of course, white can play bishop takes f6. You can find a couple of games of, uh, of Kasparov where he played uh, bishop f6 in some, some of these lines of the queen gambit and did quite well with that. That's a Russian system that some of the Russian grandmasters have played. But I'm not going to explore that here. But anyway, h6 is the normal move, and then bishop h4 is the, the, the most accurate move there. And now Spassky plays b6. And this is what originally was called the Tartikoer variation. Today it's referred to as the Tar Tartikoer Makaganov Bondarevsky variation, or simply the TMB system. The main idea here is black is obviously one of the biggest problems for black in the queen's gambit decline is the queen bishop. So here this is an attempt to for black to get rid of his queen bad bishop and simply fee and keto it on the long diagonal. It's a, certainly a logical idea. I mean, you can't beat the logic of that if you could get away with it. And if Black's uh, problem child was solved that easily, probably a lot more people would be playing the TMB. And Kasparov himself used this uh, a few times. He used it, I know, in several simuls, and I believe in at least one tournament game. So, the, and it, of course, the TMB was a favorite first of Spassky, and then later Karpov championed this line and won many find games with this system. So, you know, it's uh, you can hardly speak of it being unsound or as refuted. Spassky simply didn't find the best moves in this particular game, but uh, because Fisher hit him with a lot of surprises. But certainly B6 is a playable line. I will say it takes, a just like probably any opening system today, it takes a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge. It's a very knowledge-dependent system. But if you if you know the variations and can rem have a good memory and can remember the variations, then it's certainly a playable system. Uh, white plays c takes d5. Now, the main idea of this is white's going to try to fix a pawn on d5 so that the bishop, black decides to put his bishop on the, the b7 square, then the bishop will be more or less trapped behind a pawn. Certainly, that's a very logical way of playing this variation. It's not the only way. White can also play bishop e2, queen c2, rook c1. I mean, there's just about a whole, a whole array of different moves there that, that, that are possible in that position. But... Um, Certainly, any of the bishop e2 and, and queen c2, rook c1, those are all playable. And uh, Fisher plays something a little bit different here. He plays c takes d5, and I believe this was an original idea of Capablanca. Again, the main idea being trying to fix the pawn on d5 and force Black to play with his his uh, you know with his pawn on uh, d5. And if there's a pawn on d5, then a bishop on b7 simply is not that effective. Black plays knight takes d5. Now I must explain something here. Uh, Black is going for exchanges. And what you have to remember in almost every opening, it doesn't matter which opening it is, almost all the time, black needs to exchange at least one set of minor pieces, usually two, but at least one, and a few pawns. And this is because black is almost almost every variation, he's slightly cramped. And and whereas white, you know, is usually wants to avoid exchanges because it's to white's advantage to maintain the pressure. And uh, the path to equality usually involves black exchanging a couple, like I said, a couple of pawns and, you know, at least one set of minor pieces. So the black is trying to do that, and that's why he plays knight takes d5. And also remember that the idea is that, you know, that you're trying not to, you know, uh, in other words, if white just played lackadaisically, now bishop, well, he'd have to save his bishop. Say bishop g3, then simply bishop b7, and now if e4, knight takes knight, pawn takes knight, and then bishop takes e4, and white's just dropped a pawn. But the point being is black doesn't get his bishop trapped on the long diagonal. So that's why knight takes d5. It's for several reasons there. The main reason being that black is trying to keep the diagonal clear. White plays bishop takes e7. Black plays queen takes e7. That's the best recapture earlier in, you know, in, in the history of this variation. Black had tried retaking with the knight, but that was simply too passive, and that, that never really worked well for black. And now white plays knight takes d5. And again, I think that's probably even an x clam there. And again, the strategy is to try to fix a pawn on d5. And then e takes d5, and now rook c1. That's probably even an x clam there, too. The main point being is this makes it almost impossible. Right now, if black played c5, c takes d6, and queen takes d5, and black's, you know, dropped a pawn. So, uh, and it's also, too, the idea is maybe to double up with the d file. There's also a temptation there that black might play queen b4 check when white would simply respond queen d2. And if an exchange of queens, then black has this horrible backward pawn in the open file. So rook c1 is a very logically motivated move. And all these moves have probably been known since the, at least the 1950s. 
And now comes a new move that I think uh, Spassky and one of his seconds was one, I think it was actually Furman that might have discovered this move. But anyway, it was one of the first to be played, you know, sort of resuscitated this whole line at the time that this move was first played. The, the Tartikor variation was sitting dormant and not being used, and it was Spassky and his, and his play and his seconds that found this move. And basically the, the idea, as I've already pointed out, to place the bishop on b7 is a totally ineffective square now because of the pawn on d5. So seeing that, black plays bishop b6. And that moves an exclam, and Yasser Serwan also gives that, gives that move an exclam. Probably more to point out the ideas than necessarily that you know this move wasn't already a, a known move to opening theory. Now Fisher plays queen a4. Once more, Yasser Serwan in his book Winning Chess Bill Brilliancies he gave this move an exclam. And notice how many squares that the white queen hits. I mean, it hits a whole range of squares here on the queen side. So it's a it's a very powerful queen move. And again, I don't think that Fisher discovered this move. Pretty sure this was uh, all known theory at the time that this was played. And Spassky plays c5. This is the correct way to play. The idea is to, to uh, you know, put pressure on white center as quickly as possible. Black cannot play passively. If he does, he almost always gets a bad variation. And now Fisher plays queen a3. And I like to call this a game of many pins. This is one of my favorite games to show and teach because uh, it's very hard for my students, even advanced students, to predict what white's next move would be. Not only this, it's a game of many pins. For example, after queen a3, you can very quickly see that black's caught in a nasty little pin there. In other words, after queen a3, in other words, backing up c5, queen a3, black can't play c takes d4. That would be a double question mark move because white would simply play queen takes queen and win black's queen. So black's caught in the first of many pins in this game. And Gligoric, in his book on this match, also gave queen a3 an exclam. Of course, white's threatening to win a pawn here. If black played something silly, of course, he's not going to do this. But let's just say for a minute so you can understand what the threat is. If black played king h8, white would simply play uh, d4 takes c5 and win a pawn. So black's forced to play rook c8. And now white plays bishop b5. And this was, I believe, the improvement that Fisher had come prepared with. I don't believe it was his idea. I believe it was an idea that had already been analyzed in one of the chess magazines by GM Furman, but Fisher actually improved upon Furman's analysis. I don't know at what point, though. I'm not really sure. I don't have the original magazine article, so I'm not sure at what point Fisher uh, improved over Furman's analysis, but basically, I'm, as I understand it from Grandmasters, this is a gist of what happened. But anyway, Fisher plays bishop b5, and now here we'll look at one of the the more modern treatment of this line. And the more modern treatment of this line would be bishop e2, instead of, again, instead after rook c8, instead of bishop b5, let's look at bishop e2, king f8, d takes c, d takes c, castles, a5, rook c3, knight d7, rook b3. And so far, this is all the game uh, winnets versus Kasparov from Brussels 1987. And according to Kasparov, now a4, is equal for uh, black, and of course that's comes out of many different books, mainly MCO 14, and also it's that line can be found in MCO 15 as well. But that so you can see that that's a game that Kasparov himself played, and you know so you know the uh, the uh, variation is far from being dead considered dead today. I don't think it's just popular at the moment, but it's it's hardly uh, refuted. But anyway, here Fisher plays Bishop B5, and again this was a topical line at the time. It had mainly been analyzed. I don't think it had been played much uh, against Spassky. I don't think very, I hadn't found any other, too many games in the database where this game had been played prior to 19, this move had been played prior to 1972, and not at least the highest level. But anyway, Sp uh, Fisher plays Bishop B5 here. And again, Sarah Wan in his book gives this move an exclam here, uh, exclamation point, meaning a very good move. And now Spassky plays A6. And that was the book move at that time. That was thought to be the best move. And uh, probably a little better was Geller's idea of queen f8. That's to get out of the pin and actually threaten to take on d4. But anyway, the, the move actually played was a6. And what that does is that you know threatens to, uh, to uh, take the bishop, but Fisher's just sublimely, well, first he plays d takes c. Again, the idea is to break up black's pawn structure and leave black with after it's he takes b takes c5. Now black has what's known as the hanging pawns. There's two pawns here, and they're both, you know, they have no brethren, no protectors, no fellow pawns on the adjoining files. So this is called the hanging pawns, or the, the pawn duo. It has many different names. But the main idea is that white can 
begin to pare down and try to attack one of the pawns, usually the C pawn, black is forced to, to advance it to uh, keep from losing it, and then white gangs up on the backward D pawn and wins it. That's the normal technique in that position. Okay, And now here, white simply castles. You can almost give that move an exclam too. You know, he simply castles. And obviously note that the bishop cannot be taken because the hanging rook on a8. And again, we have another pin. You know, the, the idea of this pin down the a-file here. Here, uh, Spassky plays rook a7. And that might not have been the most accurate move here. Uh, later, Timmon, I believe it was Jan Timmon, suggested queen a7. And several of the Russians also endorsed that move. So that might have been more accurate than the game. Also, king f8 might have been more accurate than the game. But uh, anyway, uh, here he played rook a7. This is what Spassky played after, after that move. And now, now that the queen's protecting the rook laterally, then this bishop really is in danger of being captured. So Fisher retreats his bishop. I uh, wanted to point out here several different annotators uh, didn't point this out, but after bishop, I think Sarawan did, but after if white played bishop to d3 here, black could play c4, and then a lot of exchanges come off. So bishop e2 is by far the most accurate move here. And now black, now black plays knight d7. And here we have a very interesting position because uh, also black on the last move, he could have played a5. But uh, here in this position, I uh, wanted to point out after knight d7, black is caught in pins in three different directions here. Note the pin on the c file, the pin on the a3 f8 diagonal, and also the pin on the a file. So this is a, a, a very unique position and a very interesting one. That's why I call this the game of, a game of many pins when I teach it to one of my lower rater stu students here. And now Fisher's next move was rather a shock to the Russians. The uh, Russians considered this uh, a huge surprise. And uh, I just want to pause the video here for just a second just so you can take a look at this and just get an idea of um, you know what's going on in this position. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to study this position. And again, you know, black is caught in several different pins after knight d7. The last move here was black played knight d7. And in this position, black is caught in those pins. And again, once more, it's worth looking at that a second time. Um, basically, uh, you know, pins are usually a bad thing. So I think one of the things that th this game shows very well is how Fisher obviously exploited um, his superior position and he used these pins as weapons and was able basically to outplay Spassky. Now white plays knight d4 and you have to give that move an x clamp. In fact, I can tell you a true story. A friend of mine who was a guy I actually met before he passed away, he was a journalist, but he told me that Geller was running around after he played knight d4 and he thought that Fisher basically had lost it, that he'd lost the thread of the game and didn't understand chess because he's about to exchange what was a very good knight for a totally useless bishop. And that's what Geller was saying at the time, and he seemed quite happy that Fisher had played knight d4. Obviously, he can't take because of the pin, but the whole idea here is to exchange the knight for the bishop. But the first question is, why would Bobby Fisher exchange his excellent knight for a bishop that at the moment is completely passive? And that's the real question. And I think the uh, the answer here is, is, is you have to know Bobby Fisher. Bobby Fisher is a positional player. He understands uh, positional chess. He has a very actually a very dry technical style at times except when he's you know doing tactics which he also does very well obviously you know the the rep the game collection is filled with beautiful games by bobby fisher where he attacked at just a genius level but uh fisher a lot of the times when he's not playing a, a, a just a wide open attack he played his best games are played almost like capablanca i mean i believe that kappa and fisher do have a lot in common Fisher was a like a superior Capablanca, a Capablanca with a higher level of technique and also one that played the modern openings of his day very well. But anyway, Fisher's exchanging, yes, he is going to wind up exchanging what would be a good knight for basically a bad bishop, but it's because Fisher is trying to set up his one of his most favorite positions of all time. He wants to have a, uh, after this exchange, black plays queen f8 and then knight takes e6. F takes e6. Bobby Fisher has set up his favorite type of position, which is a bishop with pawns spread on both sides of the chessboard versus a lone knight, especially when he has a light-squared bishop. And you can find several games 
in the databases where Bobby Fischer wins beautifully with this type of setup. This game's a good example. Also, one of his games, I believe it's the fourth match game of his uh, of his match with Mark Tomanoff and or Tymanoff. And when he beat Tymanoff, he basically outplayed him. Had a bishop versus a knight, wound up sacrificing the bishop, and then running in a bunch of passed pawns. And uh, that's a very famous game where Fisher also had a bishop versus a knight, you know, his light square bishop, and outplayed a very, you know, strong and powerful opponent. But let's just back up for a minute first. Okay, I, I've told you that, you know, Fisher played knight d4. He's exchanging off a good bishop for a, a bad knight. But one thing I didn't talk about was queen f8 was probably not the best move. Um, Sarawan gives that a question mark, as did Byrne. It was a bad move. It certainly was a tempo loss. What's going to happen is sooner or later this F file is probably going to wind up being open, and basically the queen's just going to be forced to move again. It's not the best square. So queen F8 was not a, a good move in the situation. I mean, Spassky normally didn't like moving his king, and he certainly didn't want to make pawn weaknesses. So queen F8 seemed logical. It looked logical. It just turned out in this particular game that it just didn't work out. But it, it, it was a bad move. Probably just a little bit better was knight f6, knight b3, c4, queen takes e7, rook takes e7, knight d4, rook b7, rook c2, a5, rfc1. And this was a line given by Jan Timmen. And uh, Timmen said this was actually equal, but I did a fairly thorough uh, computer analysis with this. And I used uh, uh, Ripka 4 and also uh, Fritz 13, Fritz 12. 13, and I can tell you quite definitively that my analysis in the case that White has some long-term winning chances. I mean, I, I would let the computer run all night long, make one move, let it run all night long, make another move, etc. And I got about 10 or 15 moves in the position using that method, and it fit, basically White had almost a one game. So it's a very difficult position for for uh, for Black to uh, defend. So I won't say that I won't say it's an easy win. It's certainly far from being an easy win, but it's it's I certainly think that White has a pulling advantage main basically because of this powerful knight here. The knight really doesn't have a good outpost on e4 because after knight e4, White can just kick him with f3. But certainly this is a, a, a very good minor knight and bishop versus a very bad or a less uh, functional knight and bishop for black. And also there's this question of all this pressure down the C file. White's might manage to successfully uh, develop his pieces. And also this knight on d4 pr prevents black from playing bishop f5 and harassing white's rooks. So this is just a, a position where white has a clear advantage. But still, that would have been better than the game. In fact, just about anything would have been better than the actual game. But uh, certainly knight f6 was a much superior uh, variation. Knight f6 would have connected the queen and the rook and actually threatened to take on d4. So that would have forced white to make a decision. Queen f8 was certainly the wrong move here. But after queen f8, Fisher goes ahead and exchanges. Knight takes e6. Again, you know, the, the Russians were a little puzzled when he first did this. He's exchanging off a good knight for a bad bishop, but he's basically breaking up Black's pawn structure and giving him multiple pawn islands. And also, again, Fisher's going to have the much superior long-range bishop versus a short-range knight. So that's why he did that. Knight takes e6, f takes e6. And now White plays e4. That's a a really maybe even a double x clan move. I think this was actually a position that I learned later that, that Spassky had already reached in his analysis, but apparently no, nobody in his analysis team had looked at this e4 move. And this was the move that really um, uh, it changes this game completely. And again, the idea is to further break down this pawn island, in other words, break this up, and this idea of you know these this lone isolated pawn here, these two uh, pawn duo here and then these two pawns over here you know it's much easier for white to attack also white has long range pieces he's got queen bishop and rooks so it makes very good sense very logical sense for white to open up the game as quickly as possible so anyway e4 and, and i think now spassky again should simply play knight f6 he played d4 um i give that as box at the time uh Sarawan calls that a sad decision some grandmasters actually said pawn takes pawn would have been a better move but that's just silly because after D takes E4. Black's got, you know, four pawn islands, and all everywhere we see isolated pawns. I mean, and here isolated double pawns. That can't be correct. And uh, uh, Shredder says, uh, and Nimzo 8.0. But also, I took a look at this with Deep Shredder the other day, and Deep Shredder says after Queen H3, White's winning. It give, it analyzes for several hours, and eventually comes to the decision of plus minus. In other words, White's winning. Probably slightly better than the game was Knight F6. 
e takes d5, c takes d5, and then b3. But Spassky himself had looked at this position over the board, and he said he considered this to be completely lost, especially against a player like Fisher. Basically, black has nothing but targets everywhere. His queen's on a bad square, and his pawns are totally, they're not going anywhere. And he's going to wind up probably eventually with a pawn that he's, a backward pawn that he's going to be defending. And Spassky felt very strongly that this was a totally lost game. Uh, but this, I, again, this would have been probably better than what was actually played in the game. So anyway, just recapping really quickly. White played 20, E4, X clam, maybe even a double X clam. Graham Burgess gives that two X clams. And uh, Spassky bypassed. He played D4. And now, you know, Fisher's just, now Fisher ramps up. Fisher now has his perfect position, and I don't think there's any stopping him. From this po point onwards to the end of the game, I don't think Spassky so much as makes a single mistake. I think it's just Fisher plays his position almost perfectly. Even with the computers, I can't find any significant improvements for Bobby. So I've got to say that from this point on, that he never allows Spassky even a, a ghost of a chance. First move, of course, is F4, X clam. Uh, I tell my students all the time that most of chess is playing with your majority or restraining your opponent's majority. That's a lot of positional chess. And here, F Fisher gains space on the king side and immediately activates his four-pawn majority. And by the way, it takes away that e nice e5 square from the black knight. So that's a very good move there. Spassky played queen e7. Sooner or later, this f file is in danger of being open, so that queen's going to have to move. This, what, this is the line that shows why Spassky's earlier queen f8 was such a bad move and a loss of tempo. And now Fisher plays e5. Once more, the Russians felt like this was an inaccurate move, and they even condemned it for a long time. But it is the most accurate because Fisher just sees things very logically. He says, I want to fix this pawn here. And not only that, e5 takes away black, probably this black knight's best square, the f6 square. Uh, Spassky played rook b8. Now, uh, Sarawan questioned that and gave that a dubious. He instead recommended f6. I'd rather knight b6 in him, but white then plays f5. And I've analyzed that position practically to a win with the computers, with Ribka 4 and also Fritz 12. So I'm not sure that, uh, you know, this was that much of an improvement over the actual game. It might have been a little bit better than the rook b8 move that, that Spassky actually chose. White plays bishop f5. Now you have this pin here on this diagonal, the a2 to g8 diagonal. Another powerful pin. And it's just really... Um, um, again, let's take a look at that nice pin there, nice colorized position there, showing how this pin, and this the threat of this pin and the threat of f5 that now, now forces Spassky to duck and place his king in the corner. He goes ahead and plays king h8. And uh, this is forced otherwise, sooner or later, f5 is just going to win material for white. So black's got to do that. In other words, if black leaves his king there, white could simply play rook e1, maybe queen h3, b3, and then f5, and and black would be completely lost. So black has to, sooner or later, move his king over. And now white, after king h8, white plays another wonderful move, queen h3. This is a change of direction. Basically, Fisher says the queen side is dead. The queen has done its job over here, and now the idea is to win this pawn. If, if black takes this pawn and white wins this pawn, basically, in a nutshell, these two pawns just run through the black position. Two pawns advance and just cook black's goose. When that pawn reaches f6, it shatters black's king position. So black cannot allow that. He must defend the... Uh, the uh, uh, Gligoric called this probably the finest move of the whole game. He said this was the move to him that was really the shocker, the one that just sort of showed that Fisher was playing on a totally different level. And here Spassky took a good deal of time, uh, you know, deciding, you know, that basically I guess he figured out on his own that he couldn't allow the e-pawn to fall. So anyway, queen h3. Now black's got to play a move like either rook e8 or knight f8. He opts for knight f8. And now Fisher, of course, plays b3. And now Spassky's got nothing, but many of the Russians were feeling that, you know, Spassky could hold this position because he was a great defender and uh, he he held many positions. He was very adept at creating counterplay in even the most banal positions. And so a lot of masters were thinking that Spassky would survive this. But uh, uh, he's playing the wrong opponent here to, to survive this here. Black plays a5. This is a move that's going to become necessary sooner or later. If this move just simply rooks away, white you know might sooner or later just capture that beast. So black's basically just removing a target there. And now white plays f5. Once more, the Russians felt like that. I think uh, Geller was saying that our ce1 was the correct move in this position. And uh, that looks like a very good move there. 
but um, uh, Fisher is playing very logically here. First, he's mobilized his queen and bishop and got them to the superior post. He's got gained space with his pawn structure, and now he says, now I need an open file for my rooks. It's just a very logical progression for, 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 uh, for Fisher, although the Russians felt that Spassky's move was, I mean, Fisher's moves was premature, but Fisher, again, is opening up the F file for his rooks, X clan. And, uh, of course, Geller and many of the other Soviet contingent felt like this was very premature. They felt like Fisher was misplaying this position. But Fisher is actually playing it very well indeed. And now E takes F5. That's pretty much forced. Rook takes F5. Knight H7. White, black, white rather, doubles his rooks. Bobby Fisher doubles his rooks. He's continuing to build up the pressure. And uh, here, Sarah Wong makes a very nice comment. Continuing to build the pressure, White reintroduces the threat of rook at F5 to F7. Black can't stop this threat by simply playing rook f8 because of rook takes f8, knight takes f8, queen c8 would win the win the black knight, pinning and winning the knight. So, you know, it's it's it just shows that black can't counter the pressure on the f-file. And now black just goes queen d8. He's obviously, you know, white's threat there just to back up. There's also the very simple threat, say, I don't know, rook b6. Then white plays rook f7, and black's, you know, if he moves his queen away, White skewers a rook, plays rook, takes rook. So black had to defend against that threat as well. So he goes queen d8 here. And now after queen d8, Fisher plays queen g3. Again, he's seen that the queen has done its job on h3, and now there's no more targets. There's no The pawn on e6 is long gone. So Fisher immediately redeploys the queen, brings it back to where it's looking at a center square, defending the e pawn, and also looking at black's g7 square, and brings it back into the game. Oh, black plays rook e7. Black basically doesn't have any good moves here. He has to play defense. He plays rook e7. And now white plays h4. And this is an idea of restraint. And I want you to look at this position. After h4, notice that this knight on h7, after pawn to king rook 4, this move here, rook e7, h4. Notice after h4 that this black knight on h7 has no good squares. It can't go to f8 because of the doubled rooks. It can't go to f6 because the pawn on e5. And it can't even go to g5 because of the uh, the rook on f5 and now the pawn on h4. So basically, black's knight is just a useless piece. It's completely trapped. And this idea of restraint and totally tying up a, an opponent hand and foot is an idea that's been known since the ni early 1900s. And Fisher does that very well. And Spassky just continues to defend. He plays rbb7. He's trying to defend his second rank the way he looks at it. If Fisher goes here, he'll just exchange off. Of course, he's very happy to, to pair pair down material here and Fisher can invade on f8 because that square is guarded by both the queen and the rook so it looks like Spassky at least for the moment has everything covered and um, and really Spassky's position because of Fisher's excellent play his position has deteriorated the move where he to the point where he really only has these kind of back and forth mo uh, type of moves and once more uh, the Soviet contingent felt very strongly that Boris was defending his position very well and, and no one saw at the time how Bobby Fisher might break through this particular fortress. They thought the game would end in a draw. But uh, Fisher shows that that's just a pipe dream. His next move, again, is another shock for the Russians. E6. Okay, and they thought that move was bad because it prematurely blocks in this bishop and also gives black the f6 square for his knight. But let's look at what this e6 pawn move really does. Number one, Bobby Fisher gains space. Number two, he advances his pawn. And three, he's releasing the power of his queen and gains the e5 square for his most powerful piece. And also, too, now white threatens rook f7 again in some lines, and if black exchanges off, white gets this monster pass pawn on f7. Also, the idea of playable there was 31a4. That's just to prevent black's a pawn from advancing. And basically, black's stuck. He has almost no counterplay. But Fisher's move is very fine. He plays e6. Black just basically continues going back and forth. He just, you know, continues playing back and forth, back and forth type of chess. And uh, here we can see that knight f6, several of my students, I analyzed this line just the other day. It took me several hours to work this out, and I checked it with several different engines, Fritz, Houdini, Ripka, etc. But anyway, if black plays knight f6, this, uh, that's what white was waiting for. This, is why, this shows you why black can't play his knight to f6 square. White's just waiting around on that. He immediately plays the sack. Rook takes f6, g. Rook takes. And the, the, the very easy, simple idea is that this king is just totally, you know, exposed here. And now after a4, black might as well do that. He doesn't have anything else better. Rook takes h6 there. King there. Queen e5 check. Rook g7. Rook takes check. King takes check. e7 check. 
and you know the the game's over. I mean that's that's pretty easy to 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 analyze when you have a computer engine. Of course, sacrificing that much material and making that sack over the board is is a whole different ball game. But you know that was a line that I I spent many many hours with checking and rechecking with the computer engines. But it just shows you that Black doesn't have time for that knight f6 move because basically that's what White's waiting for. So after e6, m once more we see Spassky realizes that. I'm sure he's a good enough player. He knew he couldn't put the rook, the knight on f6, and Fisher was simply waiting for that. So he continues to move back and forth, you know, rb c7. Here Fisher goes queen e5. Again, improving the queen, putting on the queen on more powerful post, pointing right at the black king, centralizing the queen, protecting the e-pawn, etc., etc., etc. Again, Fisher, uh, I mean, rather Spassky, because of Fisher's strong play, Spassky has nothing more than simply moving his pieces back and forth. And now White plays a4. This is almost to demonstrate that now, you know, after queen e8, Black was thinking about maybe playing a4 and exchanging off this weak isolated pawn over here on a5. But, you know, Spassky said, I mean, Bobby Fisher says that's just not going to happen. So he plays a4. And now queen d8, more back and forth. And now Fisher just... I think here he's he was gaining time on the clock and basically deciding what to do. Queen e8, rook at 2 to f3, queen d8. And now Fisher decides it's time for the breakthrough. He's done. He's improved his position just about to the maximum that he can improve it. And now Fisher decides to go ahead and force the breakthrough. He plays bishop to d3. And basically now there's going to become a threat, and you'll see what that threat is in a minute. We've already talked about that this knight does not want to go to the f6 square because, you know, white will immediately sacrifice. So Spassky plays queen e8, and now white plays queen e4. And if rook takes e6, rook f8 check, knight takes, rook takes knight check, queen takes, queen h7 is mate. So that's why this e6 pawn is not hanging, and that's the huge threat. And in fact, it's that threat of rook f8 check, knight, well, let's just quickly look at that. Let's just say that black played some stupid move like rook a7, okay? Let's just go ahead and, and, and look at that here just really quickly. Let's say black played rook a7. White would simply play, apparently have that variation already programmed in. Rook f8 check, knight takes, rook takes f8 check, queen takes f8, queen h7 mate. That's the threat. That's why the, it's because of that threat that, that the pawn isn't hanging. In other words, after white plays this wonderful move, queen e4, there's the very powerful threat of, you know, rook here check. Um, I'd be curious to see why uh, king g8 there wouldn't work. I guess King G8 might be the same thing. I don't know. I guess we could just turn on Fritz 12 just really quickly and, and see if we can't just work this out over the board here. What if King G8? I imagine it's pretty much very similar there. White would play Rook F7. And obviously Rook takes F7 has got to be a loser because the pawn fork wins material. So let's just look at what happens if Rook takes... Oh, Rook takes E7. Of course, Queen takes H7 mate. So that's why that wasn't possible. And according to the computer, Black, instead of rook, horrible rook takes e6 move, he has to play, apparently Fritz is showing rook takes f7 is forced, rook takes f7, and e takes f7, queen takes f7, queen takes h7 check. And of course at this point there's no, and Fritz is already showing mate in 13, but we can stop our analysis there because I think we can pretty much show that in that position that that you know that's pretty much over that that's not going you know in this position rather in this position here it's eight seven check it's very obvious that 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 black's completely lost but anyway after after this very fine move after queen e8 and now fisher plays queen e4 we can we have seen basically that all the alternatives rook takes pawn rook a7 king g8 lose horribly and the threat is rook f8 check and Spassky has no defense against this. So at this point, Spassky is forced to play his knight to f6 to stop the rook f8 check threat. But now that's, of course, what Fitcher was waiting for because now he sets up the winning sacrifice of the exchange. Rook takes f6, double exclam, totally ripping, ripping away the pawn shield away from the front of the black king. And Serwan notes that Fisher had been preparing this sacrifice, of course, for many, many moves. And Robert Byrne also noted that in the excellent book, Both Sides of the Chessboard. G takes f6, rook takes f6, king g8, bishop c4. Again, there's a huge threat there. King h8, queen f4, and here black resigned. And the reason black resigned, we'll just quickly run through the end of the game and show you the, the winning variation there, is that after queen f4, say king g8, queen takes h6, 
rook g7, e7 check, queen f7, and now e, e8 mate. And there's a lot of alternatives there, like, at, for example, in that variation, rook c6, rook, rook f4, double exclam, rook takes e6, check, 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 mate. So you've got all kinds of different ways that black can lose. But basically, that, that concludes the end of the game and shows that basically that um, white was completely lost in this. I mean, black was completely lost. Fisher was winning e easily. So after that final beautiful move, queen f4 threatening the h-pawn and also threatening rook f8 check, winning Spassky's queen. At this point, Spassky threw in the towel and called it a day. And uh, Sarawan calls that the final deadly move. And again, he gives that an exclam. Certainly, this game has to be considered one of the prettiest and one of the most accurate ever played in a world championship match. And it gave the Fisher the lead for the first time, and it was a lead he was to never relinquish. I also think there was a huge psychological impact from this game. The fallout of Spassky, remember, this, the TMB, the Tartikoer system, was Spassky's favorite system, and he'd used this over and over again over the years, and to the best of my knowledge, he had never once lost. Uh, he never once lost in, in this entire system. So to see his very favorite, his number one system, to the queen pawn, totally destroyed and shredded as it was in this particular position, then I think that has to be a just a huge uh, um, uh, setback to Spassky. And I think the further course of the match showed basically Spassky fell apart from here. And he really had a series of where he played much weakly. And I think it took him a few moves to get his feet back under him. And by the time he actually pulled himself together, by then the match was already over. Fisher had an insurmountable lead. Uh, games, I believe it was uh, 14 through 20, were all draws. And I think if you study those games very carefully, as I have, they show some both players basically at their best. And basically, Fisher and Spassky, neither one could either scratch each other. And also, too, you have to remember Fisher was sitting excuse me, on an insurmountable lead. And, uh, you know, he was he was happy to, to coast in with draws because it was a 24-game match, and, you know, every draw brought him closer to, the, to winning the match. But anyway, thank you for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope if you have any comments, you'll write me and let me know how, how I did. Thank you uh, for watching my video, and I hope